What's up guys and welcome to One Take. I'm Gil and today we're talking about Dark, Season 3, Episode 3, titled Adam and Eva. There will of course be spoilers in this video through Episode 3, but I have not watched beyond that in the final season, so no spoilers for any episodes beyond the third one. And before we jump into it, quick reminder to hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so already, and keep up with our coverage on the rest of the season. With that, let's jump into the episode. We begin in what appears to be the mid-1800s. They don't tell us that specifically, but we see the blind townhouse we're familiar with from the previous episodes. We see him here as a child with his father. His father is reading to him from the play Ariadne, which we of course know from Marta. She performs a monologue from that play in the alternate world, episode one of this season, and back on our world in season one. We also see that Townhouse's father is wearing a ring with the Triketra symbol, and he has that cane etched into it is Sikmundas Kriatas Est. His father goes on to say it was your mother's favorite play, and he takes out a pocket watch which says for Charlotte. So this opening scene is a real brain twister. When he says it was your mother's favorite play, the first place my mind goes is Marta. And because of the Adam and Eve parallels we keep getting, I've begun suspecting that we're going to find out Jonas and Marta are sort of the Adam and Eve of this family in a very literal sense. I'm beginning to suspect that they will have a child or children from which this entire family tree branch due to time travel shenanigans. So when he says it was your mother's favorite play, is it possible he is literally talking about Marta? Now, that's, of course, strange because it would imply Marta was with Townhouse's father, but maybe we're not getting the full story here. Maybe somehow Townhouse is a product of Jonas and Marta. Then, of course, there's the four Charlotte pocket watch, which Noah ends up handing down to Elizabeth. Somehow, through, again, time travel shenanigans, did Marta or Jonas grow up, come back to the 1800s birth townhouse and hand down this pocket watch down the generations? I don't know if I'm getting it exactly right, but I feel like it's something in that ballpark. Then we jump to 1888 and we see the townhouse that we're familiar with from the previous episodes. And from this point forward in the recap, I am going to take it basically year by year, character by character to try and keep everything straight. So the blind townhouse has grown up and he's now in possession of that pocket watch and a copy of the Ariadne play. He is visited by the lip scarred trio who tell townhouse that they know He's going into town because he wants to tell the world about the time travelers. His father spent his whole life trying to prove the existence of time travel. And now this townhouse sees his father is vindicated because he's met Jonas and he's met these other time travelers. The trio cannot allow him to do this, so he takes out his favorite weapon, the Garrett Wire. We've seen him use a few times, and it's implied that he kills Townhouse. Back at the Townhouse machine factory where Jonas and company are hanging out, Bartosz returns with Marta just after last episode she revealed to Bartosz that Jonas is Adam. Bartosz is understandably upset, and he tells Jonas, you lied to us, you have no idea what you're doing. Jonas tells Bartosz, this isn't Marta, you have to know she's just using you. Magnus butts in and says, whoever she is, she may be our only hope to get out of here. And then Bartosz corners Jonas and tells him, Tell them who really killed Marta. Jonas tries to leave the room and just exit this tense conversation, but Bartosz follows him and they end up having a fight in the rain, very reminiscent of the fight they had back in season one when Bartosz was annoyed at a teenage Jonas for ditching him the night they were supposed to meet Eric's drug dealer, who turned out to be Noah, and he was doubly annoyed at Jonas for Jonas kissing Marta when she was still Bartosz's girlfriend. Then finally, Bartosz says, I told you all, all along, Jonas is to blame for everything. He is Adam. 
I loved this scene. I thought it was really emotionally charged when Bartosz yells, I think three times, he is Adam, Jonas is Adam. I kind of hated seeing Jonas not own up to the facts. It reminded me of last season, right before the apocalypse hit, people were just attacking Jonas. Bartosz tells Jonas, this is all your fault. And Jonas owns it. He says, yeah, it's all my fault, but I need to save you from the apocalypse. And I kind of miss that Jonas, the one who's just accepted things are as they are, and he's not super defensive. But seeing Marta has clearly really messed him up. So I don't think he's exactly himself here. Later, this older Jonas visits Marta and he says to her, you said I was with you in your world. Why can't I remember it? Marta says she doesn't know. She also says she didn't write the letter that Jonas is in possession of. Then Marta asks, what is Sigmundus? Jonas explains that the older townhouse, his father, was trying to create time travel so he could bring his wife back from the dead. But Jonas goes on to say, Townhouse was convinced time travel could bring you salvation, but really all it brings is damnation. Marta says she needs to hold on to the hope that somehow she can save her world, save all her friends and family. Then Marta says, I know you don't trust me, but I want to show you that you can. So she brings him outside to where she's buried her little spherical time travel device and pulls out a little capsule of cesium, supposedly all the cesium she has left, her only way back home, and she hands it to Jonas. That seems to win over his trust. Jonas brings it back to the room that contains the time travel machine prototype, places the cesium in a big bowl, activates the machine, and the cesium begins to rise. We get a glimpse of the god particle before it collapses back into that big bowl. Then they suddenly notice Marta, during all the commotion, has left. She goes back to her room, and it turns out she was lying. That was not the last of her cesium. She has quite a bit more left, which she's able to use to activate the device and disappear before the others can find her. So, as has been the case throughout the series, it looks like Jonas is again being manipulated. And for a moment, I thought maybe Marta is lying to Jonas about him having visited her world, because she could have tracked down where Jonas is right now through Adam, who later in the episode we learned she's collaborating with, but then I remember in this very episode and in this season, of course, we do see younger Jonas traveling to Marta's world. So there's an important question here. There are two possibilities. One, Jonas traveled to Marta's world and then somehow forgets. Something happens that causes him to forget and he grows up to be the older Jonas that we see here. But the more intriguing possibility, the one I talked about in the last episode, is that we are truly seeing a deviation from the timeline and the past is being changed. Young Jonas has gone to Marta's world and is no longer the same person as the older Jonas we see here. That is what I suspect is going on, but I'm sure we'll find out in the few episodes that remain. Now let's fast forward from 1888 to 2019 and switch over from our world to Marta's alternate world. We find Jonas still in older Marta's lair and sort of Adam style, this older Marta is ruminating about how we're all connected. And she tells Jonas, we are Adam and Eve. We are a glitch in the Matrix. Then she says, do you want to know why you're here? And she explains, Jonas, you are here to save them. All of your friends and family in your world and in mine. Now, at no point have I really trusted what older Marta is telling Jonas. I assume that like Adam, she is manipulating him. Well, really, like Adam and like just about everyone else that seems to guide Jonas, I believe that this older Marta is manipulating him. And that, of course, becomes clear later in the episode. I also just want to note, I love the fact that The Matrix has had such a cultural impact 
that you can watch this German show that has a serious philosophical discussion and the phrase glitch in the matrix does not at all feel out of place and we all understand what they're communicating. Old DeMarta continues to ruminate about how Jonas can never let go of Marta. Adam tried to sever the invisible tie between them, but it appears to be impossible. Then Marta reveals that she has a St. Christopher necklace that Jonas is also in possession of, and Jonas is getting sick of all this. He just wants to know why he is here. Older Marta tells Jonas that if you want your Marta back, you have to do a few things. You need to meet up with my younger self and turn young Marta into the person that I am today. Jonas understandably says, I'm sick to death of having to do things, but older Marta is able to win him over by pulling on his heartstrings, saying, ask yourself what you want. Essentially, if you want Marta back, do what I say. And if you want to manipulate Jonas and get him to do what you want, you need to hang that carrot in front of him. I can get you Marta back. I always love Jonas's outbursts. Anytime he's yelled at Adam, anytime he just gets sick and tired of all the nonsense he's dealing with, you totally understand his frustration. But the magic of it is you completely get his frustration. You understand him being sick of all this. You understand him not wanting to listen to a word older Marta says, but at the same time, at least I completely buy into him changing his mind when you invoke Marta because that has been the one shining light in his life. Ever since Mikkel took his own life, Jonas's world has been nothing but darkness and misery. The one beacon of hope has been his Marta. And he got seconds with her on the lake. He had a moment with her before Adam killed her. But he really has not had any time to enjoy the relationship that began to blossom back on the lake in 2019, our world. So I totally get his frustration. And I also completely buy that he would flip when you invoke his Marta. Then older Marta hands Jonas her world's version of those futuristic flashlight orbs on this world. They're a little bit more rectangular. And I have to wonder if there's anything more to these futuristic flashlights, if there will be some interesting twist relating to them. Because at the end of the day, it seems like they're really nothing more than just very good flashlights. In fact, you don't really need them in the cave. Ulrich was able to navigate to the Sigmundus metal door using nothing but a lighter. So uh, it just seems funny that they are the only technological advancement we're aware of that happened beyond the year 2020. But I digress. After Jonas leaves older Marta, the trio pays her a visit and they seem, like I said in the last episode, to play a role similar to Noah. Where Noah was Adam's henchman, this trio appears to report up to older Marta. They hand her Marta's play, Ariadne, which they must have taken from Townhouse. They also give her the pocket watch and the nuclear plant papers along with the master key, which they would have taken from Jasmine last episode. The middle-aged gentleman from the trio, the one who seems to do most of the talking, says to Marta, you could have told him which path you're sending him down, how it will end. Older Marta replies, he will never stop trying to break this cycle. He'll never understand that we must preserve the knot, that his Marta has to die so all the others can live. First, it's interesting to see this trio say something which can be interpreted as sympathetic. It seems that the trio is sympathizing with Jonas saying, you didn't have to lie to him. You could have been upfront with him. And it makes me wonder if the trio had some kind of a connection to Jonas. It also seems that Claudia, Adam, Marta, all these people who spend their lives, decades of their lives, trying to figure out all this time travel stuff, in the end, it seems like they reach the same conclusion. You need to preserve these cycles as they are. Older Claudia did this, Adam did this, and the Marta we see here, all three of them seem to run along the line 
of whatever events occurred, we need to ensure they occur again. And anytime they send Jonas on a mission, it always turns out that they are truly sending him to ensure events play out as they did originally. Adam sent Jonas to stop Michael Conwald's suicide, but twist, no he didn't. He sent Jonas to actually make sure the suicide goes forward. And that's very similar to older Marta, who sends Jonas on a mission that supposedly will allow him eventually to prevent his Marta's death, but twist, actually, our world's Marta has to die, and we're going to preserve the knot. So, what is going on here? I don't necessarily think that this world's Marta and Adam have the same motivations, but I do think they've come to a conclusion that younger Jonas, and even middle-aged Jonas, has not yet reached. My suspicion is that the knot, this knot is caused by all of their meddling in time travel. But I also think that all of the family lines that we see on this show branch from a family tree that only exists because of this time knot. So the knot needs to exist in order for all of Jonas's friends and family to exist. However, the knot also inevitably leads to the apocalypse. So perhaps older Marta selfishly wants to preserve the knot because that means she gets to preserve her own life. She gets to preserve the life of all her friends and family, even though she is accepting that will ultimately lead to the world's end. And even though this world isn't great, the one that she inhabits, at least it exists. Because my assumption is that removing this knot also means that Marta and Adam disappear. So her motivations here may be incredibly selfish. I want to preserve this knot that artificially props up my life, but at the cost of the rest of the world literally ending. Now you can juxtapose that with what Marta says in her monologue from the play Ariadne. Knots can't be unraveled, but they can be severed. And that's similar to what Adam says, not the knot cannot be unraveled, but it can be destroyed. And that's where I think the motivations maybe differ. Perhaps older Marta wants to preserve the knot, live in this essentially bubble reality, and Adam wants to destroy the knot. Which, if I'm right, that means Adam is potentially being selfless here. Destroy the knot, that kills Jonas, it kills this entire family tree, but perhaps that's the only way to stop the apocalypse. Anyway, enough theorizing. Next, we see Jonas walking out of the cave and we'll check back with him a little later. By the way, before we continue, just a quick reminder, if you're enjoying this video, please go ahead and hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, and of course the bell icon so you get notified the next time we do a video and you can keep up with our coverage of the rest of the season. And now we'll stay in 2019 on the alternate world, but let's check in with Ulrich and Charlotte. They're at the police station and Ulrich, who I believe is in the role of police chief here on this world, he's telling the team about the kids discovering the body in the bunker. We of course know that it's Mad's body. Ulrich and the others have not yet accepted that. Ulrich is listing the items that were found with the child, including the 80s clothing, the Walkman, and then the license, which says Mads Nielsen. Now, at that point, Ulrich starts to break down. He can't even get the words out. Charlotte comes to the rescue and asks good old Torben Wooler to take over from there. I love this scene. I love how you don't see Ulrich's face at first while he's listing out the items. And then when the camera pans over and you see his face, you can tell that he's destroyed. You can see he's on the verge of a total breakdown because, of course, this is bringing back all the emotions from 1986, from his brother disappearing. It's such an emotional scene. And as always, the acting on this show is just incredible. Ulrich and Charlotte meet in the evidence room, and Ulrich's thinking right now is that someone has kept Mad's belongings for three decades killed another boy, and then planted these belongings on that unidentified boy. Then Ulrich goes into a version of the monologue that we saw back in season one, the monologue where he talks about why he became a cop. Back in 1986, the investigation into his brother's disappearance, they made every possible mistake. The detective in charge was a drunken moron. He's, of course, talking about Egon there. And... Ulrich vowed to become a cop 
and to be a better cop, one that doesn't make all those mistakes. But look who he is now, Ulrich says. His marriage is ruined, and he's cheating on the woman who he cheated on his wife with. At that moment, he decides he needs to end things with Charlotte. Charlotte, as always, doesn't really react. She probably has the best poker face of any of these characters. A few thoughts on this scene. One, I wonder if we'll get to see the Egon Tiedemann of this world. I kind of love and hate the way that Ulrich always writes him off as a drunken moron. It was easy to buy into that characterization back in season one, but they've done such a great job of filling out the Egon character. They did a lot last season to show us more of his backstory, and you realize how good a person he is and he just got in over his head. I wonder if maybe he gets a slightly happier ending in this world, but I doubt it. It's also interesting how we're watching events play out on this world that are nearly identical to ones we've seen in our world. You would think it would get boring. For example, we're seeing Ulrich give essentially the same monologue again, but the fact that we've already seen it, to me, almost makes it more interesting because I'm constantly on the edge of my seat looking for the slight differences, the slight nuances in how what we're seeing here differs from what we already saw. It's also intriguing to see Charlotte in this role. In our world, she seems so put together and I wouldn't expect to see her in a messy situation like this one carrying on an affair with Ulrich. And she is, like I said, such a hard character to read. So when Ulrich says he wants to end things, I have no idea how she's processing all that. Later, Hannah pays the police station a visit after determining that Katerina is not Ulrich's mistress. She goes to Charlotte as the next option and tries to suss her out. She asks, you look so different. Did you get a haircut? And then gets very close to her, gives Charlotte a hug and I believe a while there inspects her hair and in that moment determines Ulrich is having an affair with Charlotte. From there, Hannah pays a visit to Alexander Tiedemann at the nuclear plant and again, we see an updated version of a conversation we've already seen play out. In our world, Hannah showed Alexander the bag that once contained his real passport and his gun threatened him with blackmail and asked him to destroy Ulrich's life. In this world, that conversation plays out again, except instead of asking Alexander to destroy Ulrich's life, she asks him to destroy Charlotte's life. And I have to say that this version of Hannah is being ever so slightly more evil than the previous version because she's talking to an Alexander that is raising his son alone after recently losing his wife. She goes right from asking, how are you and uh, Bartosz holding up? Oh, by the way, I wanna blackmail you into destroying this woman's life. So it'll be interesting to see if this plot thread actually plays out on this world, because in all reality, this plot never really went anywhere. Hannah asked Alexander to destroy Ulrich's life. Meanwhile, Ulrich was stranded in 1953. So we never actually saw the payoff. I'm wondering if here, Charlotte will actually suffer Hannah's wrath. Meanwhile, Charlotte goes to investigate the Doppler bunker where the unidentified boy was found. She calls Ulrich to check in on him, see how he's doing. Then once she's in the bunker, finds a coin on a red cord, just like the one Helga has. Beginning to suspect Helga has something to do with all this, Charlotte visits Peter at the church. When Charlotte walks in, she finds Peter with someone who you may recognize as Bernadette. That's the prostitute who worked in the trailer by the truck stop in our world, though on this world, the character is represented with more male characteristics. When Charlotte walked in, I definitely got the vibe that Peter and this character were having some kind of an intimate conversation. So I think that is one of the elements that carried over from our world into this one. So Charlotte starts to question Peter about Helga. Where was Helga last night? Back in 1987, when you came to Winden, did Helga still have the cabin? And did he use that bunker for anything in particular? Charlotte shows Peter that penny she found, and Peter doesn't buy any of what she's saying. How could Helga have had anything to do with that child's death? He was with me all evening. 
Then Peter gets a call and finds out that Helga is at the police station right now, having just confessed to murdering that child. At the station, Helga is saying over and over that he killed the boy. Charlotte and Peter are struggling to make sense of it. Then Ulrich comes in and grabs Helga, thinking that Helga did something to Mads. How did you get Mads things? What did you do to him? Then Helga has a reaction to Ulrich. You, you're alive? It was him, holds up the penny necklace. Nobody knows what he's talking about, but we, of course, know that Helga is likely referring to the fact that Ulrich is the one who inflicted the disfigurement upon his face. So this confirms that most likely in this reality, Ulrich, just like in our world, will travel back to the 50s and bash Helga's head with a rock. Very curious how this is going to happen. Because in our world, Helga snuck out of the nursing home, went to the cave, and Ulrich followed him in order to time travel. But in this world, Helga's in lockup. So I think a couple of possibilities. My guess is that Ulrich is spooked by what Helga said to him. So maybe after hours, Ulrich is going to pay Helga a visit. And in their conversation, Helga is going to say something along the lines of, I'll show you where Mads is and take Ulrich to the cave. Or another possibility is that Helga will be let out of prison because even though he is confessing to this crime, it won't make any sense to anybody. He's got a rock solid alibi. Peter and Elizabeth were with him at night and nobody is going to speculate that, yeah, sure, Helga didn't kill the child now, but he did 33 years ago and then sent the body to the future. Then checking in on the Marta of this world, she's visited by Ulrich, her father. Ulrich wants to know exactly what Marta, Magnus, and the others saw in the bunker there. When she sticks to her story that they saw essentially a portal open up and spit out a body, Ulrich asks if maybe her and her friends were on drugs of some kind. Is it possible that Killian, Marta's boyfriend, Eric's older brother, is it possible that Killian slipped them some drugs? Marta and Magnus basically kick Ulrich out of the house. But Marta thinks there might be something to what Ulrich says. She goes upstairs to talk to Magnus and says, maybe dad was right. Maybe the body was already there and we just... Magnus doesn't even let her finish the thought and says, I know what I saw. Marta then visits Killian and Killian lets Marta know that Ulrich has already questioned Killian about whether or not he slipped Marta and the others drugs. Marta asks, did you? And this very much offends Killian. Apparently, he is often used as a scapegoat, him and his family, because they're seen as sort of low class. So he says, I was right. You were only with me all this time to rile up your parents as a sort of rebellion. Marta leaves while Jonas creepily watches from the darkness. Now, at first, I sort of had a visceral negative reaction to Killian in the first episode, only because he, in essence, was taking Marta away from our Jonas. It wasn't really fair of me, but that's how I felt. Here, I felt bad for him because I'm not sure he's wrong when he accuses Marta of having been with him as a sort of rebellion. But we'll find out along the way how much of a bond she really had with Killian. Is she at any point going to go back to him or as she gets pulled into this big time travel plot, is she going to forget about him? Now, to be fair, according to older Marta, there is some kind of eternal bond between Marta and Jonas, which is probably pretty hard for any guy to compete with. Marta goes to the woods, and that's where Jonas shows himself, and they have another conversation. Jonas starts to mention some memories from Marta's life to prove that he really knows her. Finally, the thing that gets her is Jonas says that he knows the night that things went crazy in the cave, Marta saw an image of herself in the woods. She saw a version of herself covered in blood or some other black substance. Marta never told anybody about what she saw in the woods. So when Jonas says, I know what you saw because your future self told me, that gets her attention. Enough that she is willing to follow Jonas to the cave 
where they crawl down and get to that familiar metal door. However, this door on their world, instead of saying Sic Mundus Creatus Est, it says Erit Lux, which means let there be light. Now, how do we interpret this? To me, let there be light seems like a logical predecessor to thus the world was created. God says, let there be light, and then the world is created. So I think there's a couple of possible interpretations here. One, if let there be light comes first, then is that implying Marta's world is the original world? We've been assuming that Jonas's world came first and somehow spun off into Marta's alternate reality, but that's really just a bias that comes from the fact that we were first watching Jonas's world, so that's the one we're invested in. But could there be a twist which reveals that Jonas's world is the alternate reality? That kind of makes sense when you think about the fact that one of the key features of Jonas's world is Mikkel going back in time. That is an unnatural thing to occur. So if you say we've got a world, Marta's world, and then Mikkel goes back in time, that creates the world that Jonas lives in. Another possible interpretation is think about how many characters have used the metaphor of light and dark. Claudia used it to say there's a good side and a bad side. We're on the good side, the light side. Noah used the same metaphor in opposition to Claudia. So if there is truly a light and dark side, the fact that this door says let there be light could be an allusion to the fact that Marta on this world truly is the light against Adam's darkness. That would also seem consistent with the idea that Adam is trying to destroy the knot and create darkness while Marta is trying to preserve it. So a number of possible interpretations I doubt we'll get to the end and have one clean interpretation, but maybe there'll be some more, no pun intended, light shed on the question. Now, earlier in the episode in 1888 on our world, Marta used her device to escape before the others could find her. Where did she go? She went to our world, 2053. She's at the nuclear plant where she meets up with Adam. Adam says, so you gave it to him? Marta nods, and then he adds, I was always too gullible. You did the right thing. Marta then looks up, and we see that the two of them are in a room containing a version of the God Particle. So in a strange twist, it looks like Marta from the, her world is working with Adam on our world, and Jonas from our world is working with Marta from the other world. And in both cases, I assume that the younger Marta and Jonas are being manipulated. So both of our protagonists are being manipulated by each other's older selves from alternate realities. So we've of course already seen younger Jonas teaming up with a version of Marta from the other world. But I'm expecting at some point for our Jonas to run into, again, the time-traveling Marta. And what I'm wondering is instead of time-traveling Marta manipulating Jonas like she has been so far, will we see the two of them actually team up? and potentially rally against the older Marta and the older Adam version of Jonas when the younger Marta and Jonas realize that they're both being manipulated. Now, if they do that, could it possibly achieve anything? Or is that just part of the predetermined cycle of events that inevitably lead to the older Adam and Eve and ultimately the apocalypse? If they are able to break from the predetermined cycle of events, you've got to wonder what is different about this iteration of Jonas and Marta in this cycle. What is different about them from previous cycles that allows them to break from the predetermined sequence of events, if they are able to? Now, still in 2053, but cutting over to the alternate world, we see where Jonas took alternate world Marta when they went through the Let There Be Light metal door. They're in that world's post-apocalypse. Now, where our world's apocalypse looks more like a nuclear winter, this one looks more like a desert. Jonas tells Marta, she told me to take you here, that she'd explain it to you. Then we see somebody approaching them from the distance, somebody that's covered in robes, so you can't tell who they are until they get close and reveal themselves. It looks to me like a middle-aged Marta 
who then says, welcome to the future. Now, I need to give myself a minor pat on the back here because when I did my season three trailer breakdown, there were a few things I got wrong, but also a couple things I got right, and this was one of them. When we saw that robed figure walking towards Jonas and Marta, I speculated we haven't seen a middle-aged version of Marta that is kind of the counter to Jonas's stranger character. So I thought maybe that's her, and unless we find out otherwise next episode, I believe that is who we met at the end of this episode. And it was really just pure speculation on my part. So minor pat on the back there. Anyway, another really solid episode. I continue to thoroughly enjoy this season. Now seeing there's only five episodes left from here, one thing I haven't thought too much about is how does this show end? The show is called Dark, and in general, it's been pretty bleak and hopeless. Every time a character thinks they're doing something good, there's a twist, and it turns out that in reality, they have set out on a predetermined course of events that never seem to lead anywhere very happy, and you end up back in the apocalypse. So it seems kind of silly to even ponder the possibility of a happy ending. But after so much suffering, imagine how great a happy ending would feel. Now, I know a lot of you have probably binged the season already, so you know where we're heading, but I'm wondering if maybe we can get something bittersweet. I feel like a happy ending maybe is too much to ask for, but I love these characters so much that if we had an ending that's the knot is destroyed, the apocalypse is averted, but all our characters don't exist, I would probably be pretty upset by that ending. So if happiness is out of the question, I'm at least crossing my fingers for bittersweet where maybe some of our characters get to survive and live out a happy life. For Jonas, the one thing I'm hoping for is I feel like ever since his father committed suicide, he has not had a moment of joy. From my perspective, it seems like the last time Jonas was truly happy for even a moment is when he was with Marta upstairs at the Nielsen's party. So I would like, before the series end, in the next five episodes, I would love to just see one more moment of happiness for Jonas. If we're going to get a sad ending or even a bittersweet ending, at a minimum, for me to be satisfied at the conclusion of this series and not be totally emotionally broken, I just need to see that. One moment of joy for Jonas. But we'll see. Anyway, with that, I think I can wrap up by saying if you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and of course the bell icon so you get notified the next time we do a video or the next time we go live. I'm going to continue binging this season and after each episode, I'll do another one of these videos. And once I get to the end of the season, I'll do a live stream so we can have a live discussion about the season as a whole try to dissect what we saw, go through theories, and just overall process this awesome series. So you'll definitely want to make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of that. With that, thanks for watching and see you on the next One Take.